we need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is Buffalo What's Next. I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. I'm Dave Debo. And I'm Thomas O'Neill White. After May 14th, how can we afford not to talk about race? About education, about segregation, about humanity. Since the dawn of this nation, racial violence has existed. The way we have designed our society has a big hand in what occurred in that Tops Market. The suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. We need to make sure that we put more funding in our programs that help prevent gun violence and more money into art. We're going to have some real healing. We've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truths. This is Dave Debo. Thanks for being with us. Today on the program, Art and Identity. Flip some of these misconceptions upside down and tell the truth about like who black people are and like how diverse we are as people. You know, we come in every different shade. We come from every different walk of life. There's no putting us in one single box. Stay with us. Jay Moran talks with artist Julia Bottoms today. She helped develop the Freedom Wall mural in Buffalo. She's a painter, and her stunning work includes things like strong, masculine black men with flowers in their hair. A recent exhibit at the Birchfield Penny Art Center said that her work often does this sort of thing to reimagine portrayals of black men, emphasizing characteristics like vulnerability, sensitivity, and complex emotional expression. So, a fascinating talk ahead on that. But first... Today we take you to an interesting session convened by the University of Buffalo's Center for K-12 through Black History and Racial Literacy Education. Every few weeks they convene something called the Black History Nerds Saturday School. It's a chance to give teachers a range of ideas and resources on how to teach black history. This past week's session focused on a collective effort with several sociology students coming together to create the Buffalo Syllabus. It's an archive of resources about Buffalo's racism, both before and after the mass shooting on May 14th. It exists online at buffalosyllabus.com. It's a hashtag on Twitter, and it also includes a categorized list of articles, op-eds on the shooting, links to a range of articles, all designed to lend some context to the shootings and whatever discussion about it is being had. The syllabus was compiled by a quartet of scholars connected to the sociology department at UB, and in turn, during the session, each of them revealed a little bit about it, why they felt it was important for this segment. Basically, they are the guests until we get to Jay and the artist. The session began with Dr. Robert Mays, a former UB sociology student and now a clinical social worker. He started the session with a moment of silence for those killed on Jefferson. I also want to acknowledge the, the people in the massacre, unfortunately, right? It was a, a heinous act of white violence and terror. Um, that is, unfortunately, a legacy of American legacy that has been enacted upon Black communities. So I want to take some time to initially just to give a moment of silence to the 10 people that were lost and kind of take a moment to pause as I read their names. I want to give honor to the, to the ancestor of Ruth Whitfield, Aaron Sauter Jr., Pearl Young, Roberta A. Drury, Celestine Cheney, Hayward Patterson, Andre McNeil, Catherine Massey, Geraldine Chapman, and Marcus D. Morrison. The presentation continued with Jay Colley and then went down the rest of the panel to the others that helped create the syllabus. I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology at the University of Buffalo. I am an urban sociologist and public scholar who specializes in the areas of race and racism, social inequality, gentrification, and housing. Morning. My name is William Richardson. I'm a PhD candidate at Northwestern University. I'm a, I'm from Buffalo, um, grew up on the east side. Most of my family come out of the Perry Project, so for the local Buffalo people, you gotta, you know the story. Um, most of my research is on urban settler colonialism and the intersection between indigenous race share and black disenfranchisement. And I also do fiction writing on the side, imagining futures in which uh, white supremacy doesn't exist with a little bit of magic and sci-fi thrown in. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Tiana Wilson. I am currently in Los Angeles. I'm finishing up my dissertation remotely. Um, I'm pursuing a PhD in history from the University of Texas at Austin. 
And my dissertation is, is on Black and Brown women's uh, collective organizing and coalition building for the 1970s into the current moment. I'm actually from Buffalo, born and raised, east side of Buffalo, Kimfield, Linkfield Projects area. I was educated through the public, the Buffalo Public School District. So if we have any K through 12 educators who are in the Buffalo Public School District, I would love to know which school you're teaching at. Um, Again, my name is Robert Mays. I have a PhD from Morgan State University in social work. I am a social, work, social worker by training. My master's also in social work, but I went to college at Temple University for neuroscience and Africana studies. So the intersection of, of blackness and mental health is my passion. I too hail from the east side of Buffalo. I am a child of a K through 12 educators. My mother was Phyllis Mays. It's Phyllis Mays, she's a retired Buffalo teacher for 30 years in Buffalo Public Schools. So K through 12 education, the city of Buffalo was home. I've been, my family's been in, in the city of Buffalo for three generations. I really want to say almost four generations actually. And so Buffalo is home and um, it is a pleasure and an honor to be able to talk to you about that. Like I said, my background is social work and so and mental health and the provision of mental health. I am a licensed independent clinical social worker where I do have my own private practice and I treat children, adolescents and young adults with regards to trauma. Trauma is my clinical expertise. They also talked a little bit about what inspired the syllabus. Here again, Jay Colley. This was born out of the uh, white supremacist terrorist attack that occurred at the tops on Jefferson Avenue in May. Like many people, um, the four members of the collective, we were on Twitter and when this happened and we were in horror. Um, we've all heard about you know, mass shootings happening and domestic terrorism and things like that. But I know for myself, this was the first time I've been in a city where that occurred. Um, so a lot of us got on Twitter and, was, and we're talking about the history of Buffalo and the fact that, um, honestly, from the massacre and also creating the, being a part of the Buffalo syllabus, I'm realizing so many people have ties to Buffalo. It's, it's hard to find someone who doesn't have some kind of tie to Buffalo. Um, so I was able to connect with Robert and Tiana and Will, um, and we decided we wanted to create the Buffalo syllabus. William Richardson. One of the things we realized is that a lot of the conversation people were having about Buffalo was like without any context, right? Especially with people like acting as if it's a surprise, right? And we know that the um, the shooter isn't from Buffalo, but this idea that somehow like Buffalo was just like this cool city and then like this guy came in and wreaked havoc on our community doesn't jive with the actual history of Buffalo. So one of our big goals was just like people need context. They need to know what's different and special, unique about the city and the black community in the city um, to under fully understand like what happened why it affect us the way it did and like what we what we can do going forward to help recover. Deanna? So I think the biggest motivation for me to kind of participate in this, um, the, the creation of the syllabus was how, was thinking very critically about how I can use my institutional and university networks to one, raise awareness of, um, what was happening in Buffalo and yes, provide that historical context. And, and two, also learn more about Black Buffalo's history. So as someone who was educated through the Buffalo Public School District, we did not learn anything about um, local history, let alone Black people's contribution. And, and so because I went graduated from uh, Buffalo State College, I had did my undergrad thesis on this local color musicians club. And so I knew a little bit about the radical um, black self-determination history. And so immediately in the aftermath, I was like, okay, I'm a writer. Even though that's hard to say as a historian because we think we're everything, we think we're archivists, we think we're all of these things, but I was like, I'm a writer. So let me use my tools to raise awareness of this history and decenter all the national media of this like white supremacist, right? So much of it, people who were writing about Buffalo outside of Buffalo, not from the area, don't have any ties to Buffalo, was really stressing this, you know, the trauma of it. And so 
for me, um, participating in the syllabus was a way for us to kind of shift that national conversation to thinking about the people who live there, the people who have to mourn the deaths of those who were murdered untimely and those who still live there, right? And have the trauma of like not being able to access the only grocery store in the area. And so the Buffalo syllabus was um, really a way to speak back at the national discourse as a group of scholars either living in Buffalo or from Buffalo. And we also were intentional that it was only Black people to to do that work. We were, you know, we consulted, and we'll talk about that a little later, with other people of all different backgrounds, but we wanted to make sure that those who were doing this work were Black people. Here's Robert Mays. So I live in, I live in, uh, right, right outside the District of Columbia, right outside of D.C., and I've been living here for the last 10 years, and people always say, you know, you represent Buffalo, 716, Hartley Home, always rapping. And... But again, when tragedy hits and people are asking, well, what about this? And tell me about this neighborhood and to really to explain the neighborhood dynamics and what's going on and, and what is, why this is, why is this so impactful? Um, as, as a person who has a um, relative who lives directly across the street from the tops on Jefferson to a person whose family frequences the store on a regular basis, even still to this day, to being a resident of 14215, 14211, 14208, and being in those na- er- those neighborhoods my entire time when I return home and when I live there, um, it's it's real. And so to center, I'm a believer in centering Black life, um, and I'm a trauma tra- I'm a trauma clinician. Like I was trained in trauma in Baltimore, Philadelphia, and in D.C. And so under recognizing that a mass trauma a mass event has happened in your home and you have spent your formation of your um, your professional career doing that work in other places. It only seemed right so that I can't immediately get there to do something, like, you, like Tiana said, to do something else, to show love to my home and to show love to my people um, and to show love to the community that, I, that has made me who I am. They also talked a little bit about how the syllabus is structured, what's in it, and how it is grouped together into a variety of themes. Here again, Jay Colley. Originally, as we started to figure out what we wanted on the Buffalo syllabus, there are certain resources that were just coming up over and over again. So we definitely wanted to include a section about op-eds and stuff like that, about the mass shooting. We wanted to include a section on like segregation and gentrification and all those things. Once we got like the general categories we want to put together, each of us with our own expertise kind of filled in with the sources that we knew and stuff that we already, you know, been working on in our own work, things we've read, things we know from, you know, growing up in Buffalo. Um, and then we had decided, decided at the beginning, we made this like a core part of how we was going to do this, is that we wanted this to be a broader community collaborative process. So not just like us academics getting together putting these expert resources together and just like throwing it out to the community, right? We know from our own lived experience, and I'm sure many of you know, that a lot of knowledge about communities, about cities, are held by people who are not in the academy, right? Um, As a sociologist, my work literally doesn't exist unless I interact with people, right? Um, So we knew to make sure there was space for community contributions. So one of the things we did is we made sure to keep space for people to make submissions. And we got a lot of submissions to the syllabus. We put it out there. I want to say, like, I remember at least getting, like, 20 or 30 within, like, the first week or so of having it out there. And it was a lot to go through, but it was also, like, really good stuff, things that I didn't know existed. Like, there's a YouTube channel, um, a Buffalo History YouTube channel that has lots of, like, um, old clips of different, of different, like, Black history stuff in the rise. They didn't know it existed. Been watching it, um, to this day since then. But, um, yeah, so a lot of the stuff in there, you'll see that we credited people at the bottom who made community contributions to the syllabus, too. Tiana? Yes, and I would just add, um, to the importance of accessibility when we were creating the syllabus. And so just to build on what Will was stating as far as like the institution, you know, these archives housing a lot of these rare books on, you know, Black Buffalo's history, we wanted to make sure that we had different types of uh, media um, on this represented it on the syllabus. So you have, you know, public op-eds, 
you have books, you have short articles, you have podcasts, you know, YouTube channels of uplifting, you know, community organizers who's who's been doing these, this kind of work, right? And so, you know, those YouTube channels of quick videos on Black Buffalo's history was extremely instrumental. Documentaries, songs, right? Because we also was thinking very critically about having a syllabus that contextualize, you know, the historical, the social, the economic history of Black Buffalo, but then not leaving it there, right? So providing some form of guidance or, you know, Black joy to think about as we're mourning um, this tragedy, we also had sections on, you know, the abolitionist, towards an abolitionist future um, and healing and mourning and mutual aid, right? To think critically about the next steps um, and and how, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we imagine this, you know, evolving in the future. So, and then um, it was also important in, in regards to kind of like making sure we reach out to the community. We also consulted before we even made it public to, to, to the, you know, to the community, we consulted with other scholars um, and experts who have been studying Black Buffalo as well. And so we consulted with them. And so you can see, you know, we're thanking certain individuals. We're very grateful for all the, all of these suggestions, but we decided to point them out because they were ones who, you know, uplifted areas where they were like, you know, you don't have something on, like making sure we didn't miss anything glaring um, up on the history um, and context of it. And I also want to add, thank you, Tiana. And I also want to add, we also reached out to the com uh, multiple community orgs in that, in, in the, on the east side as well, in the city, in the region as well. We reached out, we said, hey, this is what we're doing. Um, we should take a look at it, tell us what you think. And so our centering community was important as well also stated that oftentimes the voices that come out or that are dominant are also the white voice and white voices in academia in particular, who are who seem to be the experts on who, who purport themselves to be the experts of black life and they're not. So we want to be really clear that we are the experts on other things outside of blackness and within blackness as well. And that we have, and that when it comes to our community, it is our responsibility to uphold and maintain that legacy. You're listening to highlights of a presentation as part of UB's Black History Nerds Saturday School. It's a semi-regular session brought forth by the Center for K-12 Black History and Racial Education at UB. Today, we're bringing you words from a team of sociology students wanting to make sure that they were documenting the 514 shooting with a Buffalo syllabus, a collection of online archives about racism in Buffalo and the top shooting. It is available at buffalosyllabus.com. Here again, Dr. Robert Mays, who served as a moderator for the program. And so now when somebody, if somebody wants to speak about um, Buffalo and particularly the black life, the black lived experience in the city of Buffalo, then you have a resource that has archived and gathered that data about black life, about black life by black people. And, and it's centered in that. So we, we did that. And we have, like you said, it has multimedia, the op-eds, books, articles, and you have all of that centered. And it's a, a, a living, it's, it's, it's breathing, it's living. And submissions can still be submitted. We um, still are looking and gathering information and to continue to build because it doesn't just stop at this one moment. I think one of the biggest portions about the syllabus is it highlights what other areas of research can be created. Oftentimes, I don't know if we have said this yet, but a lot of the time when we were talking about New York State, um, Buffalo is the backdrop, right? It's centered in New York City, and New York City has a lot of rich history, a lot of rich culture, but there are other areas in New York State that have just as much rich history and rich culture as it relates to Blackness and Black life and vice versa. And now that to, to gather those documents and really going to those archival, those, ar those archives to gather the information was really, really important. Shout out to the historian, Tiana Will, and Jay, because they were the true, they really did utilize their skill set in an amazing way. I, I tell them frequently how impressed I am. I was like, wow, like this is like that skill. And oftentimes those skills are not seen as uh, as important, unfortunately. Uh, quantitative data, data is not, is always seen as like the creme a la creme in our academic spaces. And what they did is beyond genius, beyond talented, 
and how they use their skill sets from their different universities and their different positions to really um, to navigate that. Robert, so, can I interject? We love you too, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> but I also wanted to let people know when you, so I'm, I've am i been doing um, the site building and maintenance stuff. And I just wanted to let everybody know when you go to the website, you know, um, don't hesitate to use the contact me page to let us know if there's something that's not as accessible about the website for you if there's something we could add to make it easier for you to um, use in terms of especially the organization and structure of it we tried to be you know we try to account for everything but of course we're not perfect so i just wanted to throw that in there since we're talking directly about the website to like don't hesitate to do that because we want as many people as possible to be able to have access to these resources i also saw a question in the chat about does New York State mandate Black history? Uh, I'm a style of law. Um, they're supposed to mandate Black history. I don't know um, how good the uh, the various different school districts are doing. Uh, I know we have been um, we've been uh, working with a few school districts. Um, well, we've been contacted by a few school districts to begin to work with them on uh, the Black History Mandate. But um, New York State does have a Black History Mandate. Last I checked, but um, I don't think that um, I don't think they're doing a real good job in terms of accountability, right? And maybe they, um, maybe New York State and the others that mandate Black History need to look at those states that have anti-history laws because they sure do have accountability within those laws. So maybe we can <laughs> those accountability aspects for those anti-history laws into uh, the Black History mandates that 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 we have here in uh, New York State, New Jersey, Illinois, Tennessee, South Carolina, Florida. I don't know how that's gonna work in Florida. Um, and all the uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, all these other places that, that have black history uh, mandates. Part of the Saturday session was designed to show teachers how to use the syllabus. And Tiana Williams demonstrated how to design a lesson, for example, in this case, about an abolitionist future. And so I just wanted to make sure <clears throat> that um, folks who were, you know, K through 12 teachers or those who are in the social studies education program or educators, that they have some sort of example modeling, you know, that pedagogy, we love to see it type of uh, example for how, how one could use the syllabus in their classroom. So... I decided to pick a source from toward an abolitionist future section. And you can see the website that is linked at the, well, it's not, you all can't probably access the link, but it's the Free the People Western New York. And this is a group who um, is a coalition of formerly incarcerated people, um, activists, organizers, and, and uh, attorneys who are thinking about alternative ways of community building that is not centered on carcerality or pun crime and punishment. You know, basically we linked their 13 demands to the city of Buffalo and how the Buffalo Police Department, um, what they can do to be accountable and to reduce harm in the community. If you're using this in the classroom, right, you can think about um, how breaking down each demand is, is extremely important and for how one could implement abolitionist practice in the everyday, right? So many people get terrified of the concept of abolition. Um, and so, and especially with Buffalo's history of, you know, policing and Mayor Brown and the hyper surveillance, of, especially of that community that was impacted by the mass shooting, right? Um, the first response to the mass shooting was, well, we need more police at the grocery store, right? And that, And that's not considering the community that was harmed, right? And so um, here are just some examples, right? Getting police out of the schools, um, increasing transparency of police policy activities and cameras, um, reallocating resources, right? That's a huge proponent of abolitionist organizing and abolitionist, like in, like abolitionist in practice, right? And so allocating less money to the police budget and more into reform and community support. So yeah, so that's just an example of how one could use it. And you can even have with each demand, right? You can piece apart each demand and probably assign even like a snippet of different selections of readings from the other sections as well. And, you know, have students 
one read, you know, maybe like, you know, three paragraphs on thinking about Angela uh, Davis's important work, our prisons obsolete, right? And then going to like, okay, well, how how are, how is this local community building on these ideas, right? So that's just an example of what one could do. And thank you, Tiana. So our last question is how do you see the Buffalo syllabus evolving? What are the future directions? What, are, what is what's next? Oftentimes when we talk about history, we in the past, but what we can, I believe, especially this and this season and this generation of thinkers and scholars, how do we see it moving forward? And I believe that we have a requirement to uphold how to move it forward. That's William Richardson, along with Jay Colley, Tiana Wilson, and Dr. Robert Mays. Special thanks to Dr. LeGarrett King for letting us sit in on the session. He runs the Center for K-12 Black History and Racial Education at UB. I'm Dave Debo. Stay with us. Jay Moran and artist Julia Bottoms are next. This is Buffalo What's Next on WBFO. Watch the WNED PBS original production, The Adirondacks. We've come closer here to a, a working balance between the natural world and the human world than just about any place on Earth. The Adirondacks, now streaming on YouTube and the PBS video app. This is Buffalo What's Next, where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. And we're on Buffalo What's Next, and with us from the Buffalo Arts Studio today, Julia Bottoms, local artist, uh, who has her studio here at the Buffalo Arts Studio. Julia, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. A uh, uh, real pleasure, for sure. And uh, uh, great to be actually be inside your studio here and looking at your work. Um, I'll, I'll let you just take us through just for a little bit, because I'm sure you've had to explain this, a young artist. What? Tell me about your, your work. So how, how do you describe the work that I'm looking at around us right now? Well, the work is portraiture in nature, so it's always depicting people, but I like to think of it as storytelling, visual storytelling in a way. So I'm I'm not just trying to get a likeness of a person. I'm really trying to make a statement about who they are or, you know, just their cultural identity or how they fit into the bigger message of what I'm trying to put out. So in a lot of ways, um, I think my work is shifting from just portraiture to more kind of telling a bigger story through portraiture. And a big part of of your story that you want to tell does have to do with some very pertinent issues that we talk about in this program, uh, right at the very top of it, is race. Um, can you take us through that, how that has come from you, how that has emerged from you over the years? And we were talking before we went on the air about when you were a little kid, you are drawing when you were very young, but that, that transition from being someone who's just learning how to do something to finding ways of expressing and, and then seeing that expression on canvas in front of you. Yeah. I mean, I think it's been a lifetime of experience, you know, as a black woman, I think it's, it can't help but work itself into the work because it's a part of who I am. And that work is an expression of who I am. Even if it is portraiture of other people, I still think of it in some ways as self-portrait because it's, it's a piece of who I am in a way, you know? Really? Yeah, a little bit. You know, the, the story that comes out is partially me. So the, the collection of work in a way is also a self-portrait, even if it's somebody else. That's interesting. I've never, I've never heard that description. I mean, people say like when it comes to novels, especially early novels by a writer, they're almost always bio, uh, autobiographical to a certain extent. But I never, I've never heard that, though, described uh, from a person's own work. Yeah. I, well, that's the way I feel about it. I mean, it, it's certainly not representing me, you know, at my face, but I think there is that part of me that's trying to say something with the work. And so in that way, it is autobiographical. It's it's speaking about what's on my heart and what's on my mind. And, and uh, the models are, it's super important that I tell a story about them, um, but it's also, I can't help but have a part of me in there too, you know? And when you say models, are, are you, so are you necessarily doing these magnificent portraits the model is just a, i want to say just a model or is it 
a portrait about a, per, a person specifically, and then you have them in your studio, or is it both? It's both. Um, sometimes it's more about that person in particular. I think the work that I'm making right now is it's it's definitely more of a mix this time. So now it's really bringing in more of that narrative that I'm trying to tell and sort of like working in a specific theme. Um, and I'm still trying to infuse it with the personality of that person. Just like I can't help but put myself in there in a way, I can't help but put the personality of that model in a reflection of the interactions that we've had or like, you know, just something beautiful about their personality, I think always works itself into the work. The last couple of years, of course, uh, there has been so much in the news about race, Black Lives Matter here in Buffalo, of course, 514. How have those particular events or movements found their way into your work? Well, I think sometimes that kind of stuff really takes some time to, because I have to process it too. You know, it's it's working through the feelings, a lot of anger about it, a lot of frustration, sadness about it, even grief. And I think sometimes that takes a while to uh, show directly in the work, but it, it does process in the sense of it motivates me to create the work even more so and get the message out there and, you know, really flip some of these misconceptions upside down and tell the truth about like who black people are and like how diverse we are as people you know we come in every different shade we come from every different walk of life there's no putting us in one single box and i think when we see these terrible instances of violence and racism it just you know it, it discourages me but it also makes me realize that it's so important to keep doing this work and to you know do my little part in the visual arts to try to like change things do you find it therapeutic? Uh, yeah, there's definitely an aspect of that to it for me. Um, there's the frustration that comes first. I do a lot of journaling, uh, and I think that's where the frustration kind of comes out. Is uh, Verbal journal journaling? or Written. So I'll, like, I'll write down, you know, just notes, things like that. Okay. Uh, just, you know, thoughts on things, feelings. A lot of, like, really loose, free-form reflections. And then over time, I kind of let that refine itself. And by the time I get to working on the paintings, I think that's where it's a lot more therapeutic. And it's me just getting into like this sort of meditative place almost when I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. it, it, it you've really intrigued me about this. And I, I guess I'm trying to see if there's a way for you to describe to me how maybe a nuance to something that we're looking right around here at, at in your studio right now that is, is an extension of those those notes that you're taking, those feelings that you have. I mean, can you maybe just try to d describe one instance like that? Uh, sure. I mean, well, this series that I'm working on now in the studio, uh, you can see a lot of hand gestures. Um, and that's a reflection of notes that I've been taking for a while now on just like representation in classical art and, you know, r the idea of religion and how, you know, black population, a lot of us have a very strong belief in God. I mean, some people don't, but there's certainly a, a portion of us that do. And I think about, you know, when we think about Christianity, what do we think of a lot of times? We think of this very Anglo-Saxon version of Jesus, and, you know, the, all these characters that are so whitewashed. And while certainly maybe they didn't look, you know, African, they, they certainly looked Middle Eastern. It, it's there. There's the truth about who these folks are. So you don't see melanin in those representations a lot of times. And I think that that's so significant because I wonder what that does to our our psychological state, you know, to have this thing that's so close to your heart and not have any sort of representation that you ever see around that, around these figures. So anyway, the work is kind of a reflection of that, not seeing ourselves in religion, um, not seeing ourselves in classical art on the walls, you know, all of these, in my studio here, I have reference photos of a lot of classical pieces uh, that depict different scenes from the Bible. And you can see they're all <laughs> European. Right. So, you know, that, so we're missing, even aside from the religion, we're missing from the classical work as well. And I think it's important that a hundred years from now, that's not the case. That if, you know, black students walk into galleries, they see it as the norm. It's not an exception. And uh, it's, it, for me, I remember um, there was a painting at the Met that I saw, and this was maybe 10 years back now, I want to say. And it was such an emotional turning point for me because it was a black figure. And in, classical European art. And I was like, wow, this is so unique. And I, I haven't seen this before in person, something like this. And that shouldn't be the case, though. You know, it should be commonplace. We should see black figures depicted as something other than slaves and servants. And, you know, there should be this visual history of us and what we've done and who we are.
it's interesting you should say it like that because it does reflect um, at your website. You do have a, a, a couple of really, I think, strong statements in there. But one is people of color have been trapped in someone else's narrative for too long. That's a big driving force for you. Yeah, because I think, you know, that there is a lie in that in, in the sense of like being trapped in this narrative that's fabricated around your entire identity. You know, we weren't, uh, I don't want to minimize um, slavery by any means, but I'm saying we weren't just slaves. You know, there were other things that we've been, were inventors, doctors, lawyers, uh, there's amazing accomplishments, astronauts. And I feel like the thing that we constantly see is like the victimization of us. We, we see that in the portrayals in art a lot of times. We see that in the requests from curators. Uh, it's it's less about celebrating our accomplishments or just appreciating us for the beauty of how we look. I, I'd like to see that. A lot of classical art, when you do see black figures, they're just in the background, they're servants, or you know, they're like shadowy figures, and you don't see a lot of instances where it's just the person, it's just a celebration of who they are. You did say requests from curators, so that uh, that makes me curious. So. It, it... You see that I, we're talking to curators, we're talking about galleries and things along those lines. So that's still kind of the marketplace. There's a that element to art uh, that still exists. Yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, I'm fortunate in that I think that the people that I've worked with have not asked that of me. I, I've been really fortunate to do projects that celebrate like our accomplishments. But I see not every artist gets that. I, I see a lot of artists taking opportunities you know, because they have to a lot of times, but um, there are opportunities that don't necessarily focus on the good stuff. A lot of times it's it's stuff that's, how do I put this? I call it like trauma-centric work. Okay. And I think it's totally fine to create work about trauma um, if that's what the artist's desire is. I think if black artists are constantly asked to create work about slavery and about, uh, you know, racism from the 60s and stuff like that, I think if that's not what they want to do, they shouldn't be forced into saying, well, this is how you're going to make it, as if you, you know, do this sort of stuff. Uh, they should be allowed to express themselves. And this younger generation coming up, you know, now, I think they have a lot to say. And sometimes that work has nothing to do with race. And I think that they should be allowed that space if that's what they want to do. I like doing work that's about race. I think it's important and meaningful. But I think we have to think into the future again, 50, 100 years, and make sure that there's spaces for black artists that just want to create. Maybe they want to create about botanical art. Maybe they want to create about, you know, something completely separate from that. And I want them to have room to do that. We're talking uh, today at the uh, Buffalo Art Studio here at the TriMain Center in Buffalo. Uh, one of our hopefully final uh, um, remote broadcasts that we have to do for Buffalo What's Next. And our guest is Julia Bottoms, whose uh, studio is over here, part of the Buffalo Art Studio. Uh very exciting that she's going to have a, uh, an exhibition coming up at the Birchfield this July. We'll look forward to that for sure as as well. But I, I want to talk just a little bit about your background because you um, are from Buffalo. Buff State uh, was your 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 college. Um, how has Buffalo influenced what we've been talking about here? About how, like you said, this is race is a very important part of you as an artist, what do you want to say as an artist at this time of your life? How has Buffalo influenced that? Well, I think my experience in Buffalo has been interesting. Um, I've lived a little bit all over Buffalo. You know, I was born on the east side. I moved out to the Sheridan Parkside Projects. I moved out to Cheektowaga. I moved to the west side. So I've lived all over Buffalo. And uh, I think seeing, you know, the various parts of it has made me aware of the really great things. You know, we were talking about that before. There's a lot of cool things happening here. But there's also division, you know, there's a lot of, Buffalo is one of those cities where the racial divide is so present, you know, it's so visible in some ways for all the wonderful things about us. That's, that's one of the things we really need a lot of work on, I think. And so I think um, also, you know, coming from a mixed family, my dad's Greek and my mom's black, my mom's from the South, you know, so I think it, we've been dealing with race my entire life. Uh, I've seen both sides of things, the treatment when I've been out with my mixed race family, the treatment when it's been me and my mom. And, and you know, it's it, it can't help but work its way into the work that you make. If you're making work that's really, I think, from your heart and about you, it works its way into that. You mentioned how that line of race exists 
so clearly here in Buffalo. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Are there spaces, though, where you find that that breaks down, that um, where it's more permeable, for lack of a better term, the, the line of race is, is, I want to say not existent, but maybe it's, it's a little easier space to be um, a black person Inter, uh, acting with uh, white people. Well, I mean, I will say here at BAS, this is not just because I'm here in the studio. It's not a shameless plug. <laughs> I do, uh, I do feel like this is a space that's very welcoming of black artists and very uh, just open to letting you have your message and you know be a creative and express the way that you want to. But you know, there are there are certainly spaces like that, and I think the spaces where you see people interacting the best are the ones where ego has been put aside, the sensitivity you know, to hear maybe some uncomfortable truths has been aside, put aside. I think, you know, when we can do that, there's room to talk, you know, if, if people don't get too sensitive, you know, and can just kind of like hear you out and hear like, hey, this doesn't mean that you're a terrible person, but there's work to be done. You know, maybe you could, you could be doing this better. Your organization could be doing this better. And I think when people are receptive to that, it creates an environment where change can happen. Do you think it's improving in Buffalo? Oof. That is a tough question. <laughs> I think in some ways I'm seeing improvement. I think uh, certainly in the arts, I feel like there's more opportunities for black artists. Uh, you know, I, I see a number of black artists on the rise. And I think the opportunities I've been given, I'm able to also try to like work with the youth and extend opportunities. So I think in that sense, I see some improvement. But then, you know, we have instances that set us back and you look and you say, man, have we made improvement on a larger scale? So I think it's it's a really hard question to answer. In some ways, yes, in a lot of ways, no. Jillian Hainsworth, the, the poet, um, she stated very dramatically uh, to me not long after 514 that, you know, Buffalo's East Side, Buffalo's black community is where art comes from in this community. I mean, it was an emphatic statement, one that has stayed with me how about for, for what you see? Do you see a, a creative, artistic community here? Maybe not, and, and, and to take it a step further, maybe not necessarily fully nurtured at this time. What are your thoughts about that? Like on, on the east side, do, is there? Yeah, well, oh, definitely. I mean, there's. I think that's where we really see a divide in resources. I'll say that. So we could just kind of touch on that a little bit. I think there's so much talent. There's so many talented black artists. I just did a showcase um, just like two months ago, I want to say now with Box Gallery, highlighting some up and coming artists. A lot of some some of them were known, but some of them had never really done anything yet. And it's like, how is this talent un unrecognized? And I think when you go into the East side, you may find a ton of talent, but there's not the opportunities being extended there. And maybe that's because some folks aren't necessarily getting into you know, the same programs as somebody that's had resources all of their life, you know, to get into different programs, if that makes sense. Sure. You no, know. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. So uh, there's a lot out there to yeah. still be found. Yeah. And I think that's why, you know, those of us that are in the arts and do have some sort of influence or platform have to be mindful to like say, OK, where else in my community can I extend those opportunities? And in what ways can I be of service to my community and sort of branch out and say who are these other artists that maybe haven't gotten that platform yet and deserve a moment with that platform did you have a a, a mentor or patriarch uh, for lack of better terms that uh, was was like that for you maybe a little bit coming up yeah i mean I, I was lucky that i've had a lot of great teachers to be honest like I, carol townsend over at buff state's been a huge you know supporter and influence uh taught me to write my first grants candace masters has been amazing over there and, and you know I, I've had a lot of really really wonderful teachers so and of course the ladies here at BAS have always been supportive so it, it's been a lot of people rooting for me so in that sense I think that that's not the norm you don't hear <laughs> we're, we're lucky if we get one or two people on our side in life so I feel so fortunate in that sense I, I've had something that not a lot of people get the privilege of having. Looking back at origins a little bit I mean have there been or maybe there still are those artistic doubts that ah. Oh, I just, this is not going to happen. I'm not going to make it. Have you had those and what do you do to get through? I think I've always known that I'm going to be, I was going to be an artist. And I think maybe for me, that's because I'm not defining it on whether or not what my income is for the year. Like I was an artist 
when I wasn't making income from it. I, I'll be an artist if I can no longer make income from it because I'm going to continue to produce meaningful work, you know, that's coming from my heart. Um, but I think that, yeah, when it, when it comes to making the work, we're always our own harshest critic, right? <laughs> you know, it's a, you make stuff and you think it's, you know, possibly good. And then you go back to the drawing board. And it's like, oh, this is terrible. But I think it, I know when something's going to be good. And I feel like I know when something's not going to be good, <laughs> if that makes sense. You know, I, I was talking about the meditative quality of painting. And I find and the older I get, the more I know the cues of when not to paint. Um, oh, and there's like definitely... In terms of moments or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's times for me to just go do something else. Even if I have a deadline coming up, sometimes if I sit down and I paint and it's not the right headspace and I'm forcing it, it'll turn out bad. It doesn't matter how much work I put into it or how much I labor over it. It will not be what I want it to be and I'll start over because I won't put it in something if I don't like it. So there's definitely like those cues to myself that I'm not in the right headspace and I need to just go do some laundry, do something else <laughs> and then come back to it later, you know, I think. But that's a lesson I've learned as I've gotten older. Sure. I don't know, a lesson maybe others could, could utilize as well. Um, you're not just a painter though, uh, and you have quite the sculpture project, uh, on your plate right now. Tell us about it. Ah, it's, it, well, so it's a sculpture of Shirley Chisholm. It's going to be, uh, honoring her outside of her mausoleum at Forest Lawn. And, uh, it's just such a huge honor. Like I'm still kind of in shock some days I wake up I'm like, wow, I have this amazing project. <laughs> uh, but it's great because I feel like the, it's really a crossover of skills. Like I had mentioned before that I'm working in 2D with my paintings, but there's something about understanding depth that translates really well for sculpture. And I think I've been surprised at how natural it's felt in that respect, you know, just and how much fun it's been just to work with a material that's not the norm for me to, you know, work with my hands and see something take form in three dimensions. It's been really refreshing for me. And are you still finding that ability to put that nuance in that is expressive for you? Is Are you finding that? Yeah, I think a lot of that with this project came in sort of the early part of the work. So doing the sketch, uh, the final sketch that I did and the preliminary sketches, uh, doing the mock-up, the maquette that I did, a lot of that was kind of infusing the personality into it and making some of those creative decisions. Like, you know, what kind of pattern is going to be on her dress? What's the pose? What's the like subtlety in the way that her hand is tilted? Like that sort of thing. You, you think about that in the early phases. Because I knew with this, once I got to the big phase, I didn't want to have to guess. <laughs> right, so, right. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. What have you learned about Shirley Chisholm uh, through this process? You probably have learned quite a bit. I mean, just an amazing woman. I, I didn't realize that she was actually buried here in New York, until right. in Buffalo, for that matter, um, until this project came about. And just hearing, like, the people that have been on the panel, hearing their stories about her and, like, what an amazing woman she was. We already knew she was amazing from history, but just right. to hear... You know, their one on one stories, I think, has been really powerful because you think about big figures and you think about how disconnected they can feel. But to have somebody have interacted with somebody personally is really incredible. And I think we're so fortunate to have that here in Buffalo. Well, we're talking with uh, Julia Bottoms uh, this morning on Buffalo. What's next? Uh, we're doing our interview at the Buffalo Art Studio, Julia's studio here. It's part of the Buffalo Art Studio here at the uh, TriMain Center. Um, your Instagram is J O O underscore L E A, right? Yeah, okay. So if people want to check that out, they can check it out for yourself and see some of uh, some images of your of your work. I also did find on there though um, a post from right after I think it was right after five fourteen, and you basically said in it that you needed to shut down for a while. Take us take us through that time for you. Yeah, I, I think you know as every black person I think you know there you need a moment with stuff like that you need to just have some time you know you can't immediately jump into because I think the response a lot of times is going to be overwhelming frustration and anger you know and and that's there's a place for that too but I think for myself I just wanted some time to sit with it and process and just you know feel all of the emotions the disgust that I was feeling the anger the sadness you know and just the the fear, you know, you, you hate to say that, but the fear that it instills, it, it, those are all very normal human emotions. And I think people need time to process that. And I think it's okay to take time to do that, you know. Thank you for sharing that, uh, for sure. Your murals, you, you've done some really interesting murals, including over at the Freedom Wall. Um, some legendary uh, historical figures like uh, Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King, Gloria Parks. 
Eva Doyle. You did Eva Doyle. Uh, were you doing it from a picture, or you did, did you have her in front of you when you uh, when you're doing some of the work when you're? I did it from a picture, uh, but it was great because Miss Doyle stopped by all the time. So it was, yeah. <laughs> so I got a chance to every time she stopped by, I'd take a little peek and look at it side by side and think, okay, I'm getting it. <laughs> but uh, that that one, I think, knowing that she was going to see it, I think was a lot of pressure for me too because I'm like, it has to be right. It's got to be right. So you know, that kind of spurred me on to make sure I did a really good job on that one. <laughs> I'm sure you did a fine job. But what about, uh, I'm interested about what your impressions of her were as you were doing your work. I mean, a wonderful woman, just, uh, you know, uh, somebody really uh, who values the history of Buffalo and preserving it and telling our stories. I think that's exactly the type of person that I'm talking about when I'm saying we need to honor those legends. You know, we have to make sure that their story is told while they're preserving the stories of other people. So she... No, a phenomenal woman and just uh, very supportive, too, I found when she came out. I, I really appreciated that. It's I'm sure she's busy, so oh, having yeah. her stop by and, you know. Yeah, she's busy. I try. She puts me on hold all the time. So, yeah, she's definitely busy. <laughs> yeah. uh, Arthur Eve, you also uh, did uh, a mural of Arthur Eve as well. And talk about a legend. Most certainly is a legend. And Yeah, well, he actually came to the Freedom Wall um, opening as well, which was phenomenal to me uh, to get to meet this person. Physically as well. That's it goes back to that thing with Miss Eva Doyle. It's like, wow, we have these legends, and I get to like see them in person and shake their hand and meet them. So I think um, the thing that stood out the most to me about him was seeing the way people flocked to him at the opening and the impact that he had had. Because there were people, you know, just surrounding him and people with gratitude. People, you know, thank you for everything you've done. And it's it, to me that's such a beautiful thing to know that people were still honoring him for the work that he did because the work that he did still echoes today. <laughs> it's, it's important and relevant to us today. So have also done murals outside the city of Buffalo. Cincinnati, is that the, did I see that? Yeah, the Mammy Smith uh, mural I did there. So that was a um, pretty cool one because that worked with uh, students. So they actually got up on the scaffolding and I, I worked with them as well. And But a lot of it was there actually putting the paint on the wall. So like that was pretty cool to me to see them you know, learning on the job and just how talented they were. That was, it's always, students always amaze me with what they're capable of, you know. I wish I had the talent that a lot of them have when I was at that age, you know. I had the interest, but not always necessarily that technical ability. And I don't know if it's because kids have access to the internet now and all of these, you know, masterclass tutorials right at their fingertips, but I think they take full advantage of it, which is really a great thing to see. So you've done quite a few murals I and mean, people of, uh, of history or, or legends. Um, any that you might want to still do? Good question. Well, I always say I would like to do one of Ruby Bridges. I think that'd be cool. And I've had this idea for a while about the Ruby Bridges one, but I think it'd be cool to maybe do Ruby Bridges with like a contemporary like child as well and just to kind of like bring that modern element to it. Um, but I mean, there Mae Jemison. I, I know she was supposed to come to Buffalo actually at one point. I think last year, and uh, I was hoping maybe I could like, hey, <laughs> could I get in there and just get an interview, snap a couple shots? But I, uh, it didn't end up getting canceled. I think in the end. So let's maybe just talk a little bit more about uh, then the Birchfield exhibition that's coming up. Uh, again, I mentioned it was in July. Uh, what should we expect? So this series that I'm working on now um, that's really dealing with religious iconography and black figures kind of in these classical poses, a lot of uh, fabric draping, stuff like that. Those are the main uh, pieces I'm be focusing on for this show. I'm also kind of venturing into motherhood, you know, doing paintings that explore that. So there's sort of that element of the Madonna and child working its way into some of the pieces too. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot of that the classical influence, which I think inspires a lot of my work in general, but it's much more uh, much more prevalent and much more intentional, I think, in these pieces. You know, I, I think any viewer could stand there and say, okay, I kind of get what she's trying to say with this. You know, I'm sure there's more that we could discuss, but they're going to get the reference instantly. Another thing I saw on Instagram that I thought was uh, curious, you, you have a, one of your paintings and it's not complete. It's half complete, and underneath it, you say, "I wish they could stay like this." Yeah. <laughs> well, explain that thought. I just love that in between process. I mean, I don't know if it's because I just love the figure so much, and I do think there's something to be said for you know the pieces I have here in the studio that have you know the hands fully complete, like very lifelike, and the face fully complete. 
And then there's just this empty kind of space where, you know, maybe a, a wrist cuff is or like a, a drapery, something like that. There's something interesting about that to me, the contrast between this really refined portion of it and this completely flat surface as well. So I, I'm thinking that's more of an aesthetic sort of artistic exploration for me to look into. Um, but I, I'm curious what it says, I guess, on an emotional level as well. And that's something I think I have to journal more and figure out what it's saying to me. Talk about that process, because I said that you, you caught me, uh, I was about ready to wrap up with a couple of questions here, but when you say, when you talk about, you know, want to journalize it more and and look look it through it, just, if you can, try to explain that process to, to us, how that all connects for you as you move forward. Yeah, well, I, I think I had mentioned earlier, the journaling for me is where the thoughts can just be free form. I don't have to put any rhyme or reason to them. I can just say what's on my mind, you know? And I think there needs to be a space for that. And then I refine it. You know, maybe that first journal entry is kind of chaotic and hectic and emotional. And then the next one, I'm taking one piece from that that really stuck with me and I'm refining it, reflecting a little bit more on that. Uh, maybe in the next one, I'm refining it even more and bringing in some outside information. Maybe I heard something in a video clip or I read something that ties into it. You know, I... I I believe in, in some ways, kind of like looking for signs around you too, you know, like uh, just seeing how like things connect. And sometimes I feel like that happens, you know, with the work that I'm working on and the journaling that I'm doing, I'll see something that feels like it connects to that. And I try to refine that. That sounds, I don't know, I feel like that sounds confusing, but. No, no. I, I mean, I, I understand. I think what you're trying to express there, there's, there's something that's not really necessarily easy to describe in a concrete way but there's definitely things that come through whether it's your intuition or your instinct or yeah your intuition i mean i'm sure people have all, all different takes the universe right. god spirituality i mean i think i'm a very spiritual person and you know i think that intuition is a part of that too so i think those things kind of feel like they connect for me sometimes and work their way into the final piece as we are winding down here one of the questions we do like to ask um our guests on this show because it's called buffalo what's next what does buffalo need um you can take that from any way you want but just when it, when you hear that that question what comes to your mind i think the first thing i think is buffalo needs maybe how do i phrase it stewardship of its resources good better stewardship in some ways i think that we have so much here you know we're not a poor place. We have a lot of resources. We have a lot of like things that we could offer to one another. And I think if we could really take time to think about what each of us has, you know, whether you're an executive, you know, at a bank or something, or if you're, you know, a person like me, who's just an artist, I think we need to each think about what we have to contribute and how we can invest that in the betterment of the Buffalo community and like within our own individual communities. Uh, like I was saying with the East Side, you know, we need to look at that. That's a part of Buffalo. I, I think there are people that certainly want to pretend like it's not. And say, oh, well, you know, Buffalo Renaissance, downtown waterfront. But it's a part of Buffalo, just as much as the waterfront and uh, just as much as the Elmwood Village. And if we ignore it, not only is it wrong on like a human to human level, but we're missing out as Buffalonians. We can't sit here and get excited about like rallying around the bills and everything and then just like ignore our neighbors and ignore food deserts and, you know, pretend like that's the ugly part of things that we just want to sweep away. We have to think about the stewardship of what we have and how do we distribute that in a way that's, you know, helpful to one another. Julia Bottoms, thank you very much for joining us at Buffalo What's Next. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. This is Buffalo What's Next on WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOL and Oleant, WUBJ Jamestown.